Hello and welcome to this webinar on the completeness check performed by ECHA. My name is Joost Rutten and I will be moderating today's webinar. During this webinar, several completeness check experts will give you useful information on preparing a registration dossier which can be successfully submitted to ECHA. We will start this webinar by a presentation by Tamas. He will give you an overview of the completeness check process done by ECHA and will also address the TCC letters. He will then continue with a presentation about the validation system. Here he will show you how you can use this application on your data sets and dossiers. Then Essie will take over and she will uh, cover the manual che checks performed by ECHA staff. Here she will cover the topics which include the manual verification and how you can put your data in your dossiers in the correct way. Our next presenter is uh, Tiffane. She will address some con common cases based on concerns of industry. She will explain how ECHA will handle these cases and how you, uh, what you should do when you are in a similar situation. And she will also cover the select, uh, support section by ECHA. At the end, I will uh, have some final remarks and end the webinar with a Q&A session where today's presenters will give you uh, questions on some frequently asked, asked questions. Uh, you can submit your questions uh, through the Q&A panel at any time during the webinar or till half past 12. Our panelists will give you a written response uh, till 1 o'clock. If you did not receive an answer by then, please resubmit uh, your question using our contact form. And as I already mentioned, at the end of the webinar, we will have a short Q&A session where we will cover some frequently asked questions. Uh, the webinar uh, will be recorded and published together with the used materials on our webinar website. Um, here you can look through the uh, slides again and also click on the links which are implemented in these slides. And also the most frequently asked questions will be added to our Q&A panel website. Uh, you can find uh, the Q&A panel in the right corner of your screen. Uh, here you can write your answers and our panelists will give you a written response. Uh, please monitor this uh, section when you ask a question and uh, remain log logged in to the end of the webinar if you received a response. Uh, there is a uh, character limit for questions, so try to be brief and concise when asking the question and only submit questions related to the webinar topics. So don't include any confidential business information and also when you have questions about your specific submissions, please send those questions using our contact form. And if you uh, experience any difficulties with the webinar, uh, you can contact us via the Q&A panel, or you can send an email to conference.eka.au. We will now continue with the first presentation about the completed check process done by ECHA. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joost. Hello, everybody. My name is Tamás Solomon, and I am going to talk you through on how does the completeness check process works at ECHA. And I will give you some brief introduction to the letter you receive in case of a failure completeness check uh, and what kind of information you can find. In the First, uh, let's see. Uh, this is an overview of the submission process. It starts with the registrant submitting a Euclid 6 dossier in Reach IT. After that, it goes through some pre-processing where we check uh, for viruses or if the file format is correct. Then uh, the dossier goes to, to business rule checks where this is the first place uh, a registrant can fail. Uh, if you fail at business rule checks level, then you can submit your dossier after this as soon as possible. Then after that, the, tech, uh, the completeness check procedure uh, comes, which is a parallel process, which includes the technical completeness check on the dossier, as well as the financial completeness check, which is basically the payment of the invoice. The result of these two will give the overall completeness check result, and you will get uh, a decision in reach IT about this. 
After that, uh, some other ECA processes uh, will take place on the dossier, such as uh, confidentiality claims check and dissemination. So the, as you know, the completeness check ensures that all required elements are in the registration dossier as per Article 20 of REACH, uh, REACH legislation. Uh, the completeness check is performed on each registration dossier submitted to ECA, regardless if it's being an initial submission or an update uh, submission. Uh, now I'm going to talk, to talk you through a little bit of the history of the completeness check. Well, since 2010, uh, ECA translated uh, the REACH requirements into automated completeness check rules. And uh, after that, for six years, it remained basically unchanged. Uh, over this time, ECA collected experience on how well the completeness check implementation served its purpose. And based on these experiences, uh, from 21st of June 2016, an enhanced completeness check entered into force, which, con uh, which contains revised automated rules, as well as additional manual checks performed by our staff. These manual checks means that the completeness checks can take a little bit longer than before, but not more than three weeks. If you are planning uh, to update your registration, and the previous dossier was submitted using Euclid 5, then you may need to revise the data before submitting it in Euclid 6 form. Uh, please reserve some, some time for this. However, it is important to mention that ECA does not force it to modify the completeness check further before the 2018 deadline. Um, now I am going to uh, talk to you about a little bit uh, the possible outcomes of the completeness check uh, and the consequences of it. Well, first of all, if the technical completeness check passes, that means uh, that uh, if, it's an, if, it, if it was an initial submission, then you will get a registration number. If uh, you updated an existing registration, then we accept the updated information to our database, which means that it makes it available for further processing by ECA. Uh, from this decision, you will get a message uh, in Reach IT. And if the payment or invoice were issued, then uh, you need to pay that as well. Well, if you would fail uh, the technical completeness check, then you would receive a letter in Reach IT task box. Uh, this is the same for both initial submissions and updates of existing registration. Uh, this letter will specify that you have only one possibility to submit a complete dossier. And uh, you will also get a deadline specified also in this letter by which you need to issue updates. Um, if you would fail to provide the required information for the second time, which means that you either uh, did not provide any updates by the deadline specified in the letter, or you would have provided the update, but it would still fail the technical completeness check, then a negative decision in the Reach IT task box uh, will be issued to you, informing you that the submission has been rejected. Uh, for initial submissions, uh, this means that the registration number will not be granted, and if there was any fee involved, then this not be refined it, refounded. If it was an update of an existing registration, then the updated information will not be accepted into ECA's database. Uh, that also means that it won't be available for subsequent processes. But uh, you will be able to keep your registration number. After rejection, you can submit a new dossier for the substance as soon as, as, soon as you get the notification in Reach IT. As I mentioned before, after the failing uh, at a technical completeness check for the first time, a letter is sent to you via Reach IT. During the next few minutes, I will explain what kind of information you can find in this letter. First of all, uh, you can find this letter easily uh, in the submission page in Reach IT under key documents, as illustrated in this screenshot. The Technical completeness check letter basically contains uh, three uh, main information source. Uh, 
one is the main body of the, the letter, which contains the deadline by, by when you are requested to correct failures and resubmit your dossier. Then two annexes. Annex one contains detailed information about the causes of incompleteness and instructions for correcting failures, while Annex two contains instructions for creating updates of dossier and validating it before submitting it. Let's take a look uh, a little bit to these three information in depth. First, uh, the deadline to correct the failures and submit the improved dossier can be found on the very first page of this letter, uh, highlighted in our screenshot. Then in Annex 1, you can find the detailed information of your failure. Uh, first, the failing section and the document name this refers to Euclid sections and the document name in Euclid. Then a description of the failure, which tells you uh, what, is exactly the, what is exactly causing the failure. Then some instructions on how you can correct it. Some reference to our relevant support material. And then indication when the failure cannot be detected by the validation assistant. In Annex 2, uh, you can find instructions on how to submit a dossier in response to the technical completeness check letter and the reminder to use the validation assistant. It's really important to mention here to use the correct submission and communication number specified in this annex, otherwise you will fail at business rule steps. So to summarize, uh, the technical completeness check letter, the most important things to keep in mind are to read the failure descriptions carefully in Annex 1 of the letter and follow instructions for correcting failures. Then use the available support if needed. You need to correct all the failures listed in the letter before submitting the next dossier uh, to ensure that you won't fail technical completeness check again. And uh, Contact us well before the technical completeness check deadline if uh, you are not sure how to correct the failure. As the registration deadline in the end of May of 2018 approaching, I would like to share some tips with you. First of all, due to the increase uh, of the number of registrations close to the deadline, receiving a technical completeness check outcome can take longer as well as ECA has uh, a legal obligation uh, to process a bit longer your registration. This can take up to three months after the deadline. Then uh, members of a joint submission can submit their dossiers as soon as lead registrant has passed the business rule check. Member dossiers only declared complete and get the registration number once lead dossiers has passed completeness check, as they rely on the information to be complete. Uh, if the lead would be pending at the TCC level, it means that the members are also parked during the TCC procedure till an outcome is issued to the member. If your dossier would fail at completeness check, uh, you would have only one possibility to update the dossier within that submission. So please consider that, and it is advised to not leave your submission to the last minute. And now I am going to show you how to use the Validation Assistant plugin in Euclid to check the completeness of your dossier. First, uh, let me introduce the Validation Assistant plugin. ECA makes this plugin available for industry as part of, a, as part of Euclid to help the registrants in preparing dossiers. It basically carries out validations on the data set and dossiers to verify that the information provided as expected. The outcome of this validation is a report listing all the rules for which the validation has failed. Use the validation assistant before you submit your dossier to minimize the risk for failures and rejection. An efficient way to do so is to check your substance data set before the dossier is created to correct any already reported failures then it is also highly advised that uh, you check the final dossier before submitting it via ReachIT, because there are some uh, checks that can be only uh, shown checked on dossier. 
As a general rule of thumb, uh, please uh, never submit your dossier if there are still failures given by the validation assistant. It means that your dossier will fail either at the business rules or completeness check steps. So now I am going to show you uh, how to run the validation assistant and how to understand the report it gives. First of all, you need to access uh, the Substance dataset from uh, the Substance dataset menu in Euclid. After you find your Substance, you need to right-click on the dataset and select the Validate, as illustrated in the screenshot. After this, uh, you need to provide uh, some information requested by the tool in the next steps, which are basically identical to the information uh, while you are creating a dossier. So this is the validation assistant outcome, the validation report. Uh, the default view shows you the submission check tab, where you can see all uh, the total number of submission check failures. And now I am going to show you uh, how to understand the different pieces of information this tool gives you. First of all, there is the rule ID. This is uh, an important piece of information if you would uh, like to communicate to ECHA regarding a failure then uh, please quote this rule ID. Otherwise, this uh, doesn't give any additional information on how to fix the failure. Then you can see the failing Euclid section numbers and names. Uh, this is, uh, makes it easier to navigate inside of the Euclid, and you can find the failure. Then you can see the name of the failing document, endpoint study record or other record. This is especially useful if you have many failures uh, or many uh, records. In the then you can find a failure description called message under the message uh, tab. This message basically tells you what is the failure and how you can fix it. So please read through of it. It really provides uh, important information. Uh, you don't need to close the validation assistant if you would like to correct the failures. You can navigate to the failing document by using the open document in the Substance Dataset button, which you can access either at the to top of this report, it's highlighted here, or by right-clicking uh, in the actual failure and selecting after that the open document. Under section name, you can find uh, additional information on how you can find the failure inside of the record. First of all, as illustrated in this uh, example, you can find the name of the table in case the failure is uh, found in a table. In this example, it is the analytical determination table under, under analytical information record. Uh, the par two in parentheses means that the failure is located in the second row of this table. This is especially useful if you have many rows in tables. As I mentioned before, you don't need to uh, close the validation assistant to correct the failures, uh, because that makes you able to recheck the results of the validation in a much efficient way. But uh, please remember that first you need to save the changes you made. Then, in case the validation assistant disappeared, then you can unhide it, uh, clicking on the button highlighted in the second screenshot. This can be located on the bottom right of the Euclid user interface. And after that, uh, you can click on the recheck button in the validation assistant report, so that uh, you can see if you amended the, the failures correctly. To summarize the validation assistant uh, presentation, please remember the following things, that you need to correct all the failures indicated by the tool before submitting it. Uh, you should not submit any dossier uh, as long as you have uh, submission check failures indicated by the validation assistant. And please also note the information uh, provided by the validation assistant in case uh, you would end up with uh, zero failures, as illustrated here. Uh, this means that additional checks performed by our staff uh, and the validation assistant cannot predict these sort of uh, checks. 
but uh, next my colleague Essie will talk about these manual checks part of the complete check. Thank you, Tamas. Uh, my name is Essie and in this part of the webinar I will cover in general what the manual checks mean, what is the focus of the manual checks, and then give you some practical examples and tips on how to submit a complete dossier successfully. So just as a little bit of background information and in general about the checks, as Tamas already mentioned, as of June last year, the completeness check was complemented with additional manual checks which are performed by ECA staff. These checks focus on certain elements of the registration dossier which cannot be checked automatically and therefore they are also not detectable by the validation assistant. The aim of the manual checks is to ensure that the registrants who deviate from the standard requirements provide a justification that is in line with REACH. Therefore, the scope is on completeness and not the quality or compliance of your dossier. ECA has published a detailed document about the manual checks on the ECA website. This document is updated regularly to ensure that the most recent information is always available for industry. You can find the document under manuals and support. The current focus of the manual checks covers four topics of the dossier. Firstly, the substance identification, which includes UPAC name, the composition, manufacturing process description of UVCB substances, and analytical information. Secondly, the justification for waiving standard information requirements uh, for physiochemical, environmental fate, and hazard information. The third focus is on new testing proposals on vertebrate animals, and here we check that the uh, considerations for adaptation possibilities have been provided. And finally, the justifications for waiving chemical safety reports. Now I will walk you through in more detail the requirements for each of these four topics. Starting with the substance identification, the first requirement is to provide the UPAC name in Euclid section 1.1 under the reference substance. In case your registered substance has no official UPAC name, you must provide the chemical name in the UPAC name field. For multi-constituent and UVCB substances, it's not always as straightforward to derive the UPAC name or chemical name. So here you are uh, asked to consult some good examples through Q&As on the ECA website. And here is also a screenshot of the relevant Euclid section under reference substance. You can navigate to it by clicking the small arrow highlighted in red and that will open up the field for you to edit the UPAC name field and enter the appropriate information. Next, I will go through uh, the standard requirements for well-defined substances when reporting their composition. Starting with the number of constituents, when you're registering your substance, you must indicate whether you're registering a mono or a multi-constituent substance. For a monoconstituent substance, each reported composition is expected to have only one constituent, whereas a multiconstituent substance is expected to have more than one constituent for each composition that you report. However, there are some cases which might deviate from this standard. For example, in terms of monoconstituents, in case you are registering a multiconstituent substance through the individual constituents as, a monoconstitu as monoconstituents, in this case, or in any case of deviations, you must report them in the justification for deviations field, which you can find in Euclid section 1.2. I will in the next slide show you how to navigate to this field. The deviations from reporting constituents of a multi-constituent substance separately is very exceptional, and you also must justify this under the justification of deviations field. Uh, for these cases, you can consult some case examples, for example, for isomers and hydrates through Q&As on the ECA website. Should you have any problems um, indicating your constituents on, for mono or multi, please refer to the guidance for identification and naming of substances under REACH and CLP. 
So here is the screenshot of the relevant field where to report in case you have any deviations. You can find it under general information in Euclid section 1.2 as highlighted here in the bottom left, the justification for deviations. Compositions of monoconstituent substances in general should follow the 80-20 rule. This means that the main constituent is expected to be present at a minimum concentration of 80%. Respectively, impurities are expected to be present at a maximum of 20%. Any deviations from this 80-20 rule must be justified in the justification for deviations field, which was just presented in the previous slide. And again, should you have any questions regarding um, reporting the composition for a monoconstituent substance, please refer to the guidance. The same applies for compositions of multi-constituent substances with the 80-10 rule, which maintains that constituents are expected to be present, the main constituent expected to be present at a maximum of 80% and impurities at a maximum of 10%. And again, in case of any deviations from this standard rule, please justify them in the justification for deviations field. In these previous slides, I've covered the expectations on some typical deviations for well-defined substances. However, for substances of unknown or variable composition, so so-called UVCB substances, some specific information requirements apply which I will go through in the following slides. Also for UVCB substances, the composition must be provided. So all constituents uh, of each reported composition must be provided in Euclid section 1.2 under constituents. All individual constituents present at more than 10% or relevant for the classification and labeling and or PBT assessment must be reported separately. Other constituents should be identified as far as possible as separate constituents or as groups of generic constituents. In most cases, it is possible to identify the separate constituents or groups of the UVCB substance. However, in some exceptional cases, if you consider that it is not possible to report constituents or groups of the constituents separately, you must include a scientifically fully substantiated justification in the previously shown justification for deviations field. When reporting the composition for a UVCB substance, make use of the analytical information data that you have available. The manufacturing process description of UVCB substances must also be provided. The description of the source used and the process applied must be included in the description of composition field, which is also found in Euclid section 1.2. UVCB substances by definition cannot sufficiently be identified by their chemical composition alone. Therefore, they require information on the manufacturing process for their identification in addition to what is known about their chemical composition. Regarding the manufacturing process description, people have expressed some concerns regarding the dissemination and publishing of this information. And I just want to clarify here that this information is not published for legal entity compositions, so meaning the registrant's own compositions. When reporting the process description, there are some really good Q&A examples available on the ECA website should you have any problems filling in the required information. And you can also make use of the free text template on Euclid, marked with a capital A, which will help you to report all the relevant information. However, please note here that you must fill in the relevant data for your substance. Inserting the template alone will not be considered complete, and it will not um, pass the completeness check. The final topic under substance identification concerns the analytical information. Here it is important to note that both identification and quantification must be addressed. You can report them separately in both in their own attachment or you can choose to 
report them together in one attachment. However, you'll need to indicate your choice in the purpose of analysis field highlighted here in red. Now we'll move on to cover the data waiving justifications, meaning that you sort to use the provisions according to REACH to omit a required study. In general, you have four alternatives to fulfill the REACH requirements for physiochemical, environmental, faith and hazard information in Annex 7 to 11, which correspond to the Euclid sections 4 to 7. These four options are also listed in the TCC letter, which Tamash talked about, in case your data waiving justification was considered invalid in your first submission. Your first option is to provide the standard required study. However, if you do not have access to the study or are unable to conduct it, you can sort to an adaptation according to Section 1 of REACH Annex 11. If you use one of these adaptations to fulfill the information requirements, such as a QSR or a read-across approach, it is important to report this in Euclid as an endpoint study record and not inside of a data waiver. Your third option would be to provide a testing proposal for Annex 9 and 10 information requirements and then carry out the appropriate test after you have received a decision from ECA. And finally, you can provide a data waiving justification in accordance with column 2 of REACH Annexes 7 to 10 or Annex 11 sections 2 and 3. Now we'll move forward to look at how to report a good data waiving justification in Euclid if you were to sort to one of these options under Annexes 7 to 10 or Annex 11, 2 and 3. First and foremost, you should consider if you indeed have a reach consistent way to justify the waiving. For Annexes 7 to 10 and Annex 11 sections 2 and 3 adaptations, you have the option to use the pick list values which are available in Euclid. You can consider if one of these op options apply to your particular case. However, if they don't, none of the options apply to your specific substance, then you'll choose other and provide a scientifically substantiated justification in line with REACH correct annex. We will go through some examples on how to do this appropriately. You can always provide more information in the field justification for type of information or attach a file in the attached justifications field. In case you need to refer to another section of your dossier, please make use of the cross-reference field. Here is a screenshot from Euclid of the relevant fields that you, use to fill, you need to fill in when providing a data waiving justification. The fields marked in red are mandatory to fill in, and the ones in green indicate where you can provide additional information if needed. It's really essential to note that you must provide a summary of the justification either in the remarks field or the field justification for type of information, even if you sort to refer to somewhere else in the dossier. A cross-reference alone will not be considered enough and complete and will not pass the completeness. Now we'll go through some examples of complete and incomplete waivers. In these first examples, the author has made a statement that the substance does not self-ignite or that the substance is not explosive. However, this is not enough to just state um, that you don't expect the substance to possess a certain quality. You must give a scientifically robust explanation, which is in line with column two of REACH, for why the test does not need to be conducted. It is not enough to just refer to your opinion or experience. So for the first example here, there's a correct reference to reach Annex 7, Section 7.2 from Column 2, that the test on self-ignition does not need to be conducted as the substance is a liquid with a flash point above 200 Celsius.
In these second examples here, the importance that I wanted to highlight is that you need to be very precise on what you base your justification on. It's not enough to just state that you're not expecting the substance um, or the aquatic plants to be exposed to the substance. You must indicate why this is a relevant statement. So for example, to say that the substance is highly insoluble in water. In the second example, there's a correct reference to the REACH Annex 11, Section 2, that the tech, uh, study is technically not possible. However, it's not enough alone to state that the, that the test is technically not possible to conduct, but you must substantiate why it's not possible. For example, to say that the, the study is technically not possible as the substance is a gas. In these examples, the main point is on the importance of always stick to the waiving possibilities within reach. If you can't waive based on reach, your waiver cannot be considered valid. Here the author has provided a long description of the substance being a UVCB. However, also UVCB substances must be tested. So to state that the substance is a UVCB is not enough to waive a test. In the second one, the same applies for naturally occurring substances also these substances must be tested. Your second option in fulfilling the information requirements would be to submit a testing proposal. For Annex 9 and 10 requirements, you can always provide a testing proposal instead of a data waiver and conduct the required study. In case of a testing proposal on vertebrate animals, you need to ensure to include the considerations for alternative methods in the correct field in Euclid. Next, we will cover the requirements for testing proposals in more detail. The considerations for alternatives must be provided in the field justification for type of information showcased here on the screen. It is really uh, important that the information is in this specific field because it will be published as part of the third-party consultation for the testing proposals. You are strongly advised to use the text template provided in the field and marked with a capital A. This template lists all the elements that you need to address when documenting your considerations. And again, please note that submitting an empty template without any considerations will not be considered complete. You must include all the relevant and comprehensive details of your considerations. Lastly, the chemical safety report must be provided or a clear justification for why a CSR is not required must be included. If a CSR is waived, you must have a justification in accordance to reach Article 14, included in the Section 13 in the field further information on the attached file or the field discussion. It is not sufficient to just refer to the Article 14 alone, but you must provide an explanation why you waive. In example states that the substance is not DBT and is not classified for any of the endpoints. So to summarize some key points, how to um, submit a complete dossier, be clear and transparent. When providing a justification, be very clear and precise on what you base your justification on. Give a summary of the key points in the expected field, and if needed, refer to the correct field or section where further details are given. Remember that it's not enough to just refer to another section without any further explanation. It is important that you use the right field to report the information, as ECA cannot search through the whole dossier to find it. Make use of the available manuals, as well as the built-in help system in Euclid. We are strongly encouraged to read through the document provided on manual checks on the ECA website. And in case your first submission has failed, 
read carefully through the TCC letter and the failure message in Annex 1. As mentioned by Tamas, uh, all the details regarding where to report the requested study and how to do this is provided in the letter. And again, run the validation assistant on your data set and the created dossier before submitting it to REACH IT. To wrap up some key points regarding the manual checks. So the aim of the manual checks is to increase the availability of relevant data provided in the dossiers. The scope of the manual checks is completeness, not the quality or compliance of the dossier. Please familiarize yourself with the document available on the ECHA website. You can find it under support and manuals. Now I would like to thank you for your attention from my part and welcome my colleague Tiffan who will walk you through some common cases as well as the extensive support available through ECHA. Thank you, Esti. Hi, I'm Tiffen, and I'm going to present you some common cases that have been reported to us by industry, and we will then have a look at the different options of support that are offered to you by ECA to ensure successful submissions. We will go through four typical cases regarding submissions. What are the consequences of failing the completeness check for the second time? How does the TCC impact the ECA decisions and deadlines. How to report an ongoing study when you are updating your dossier. And finally, how to process with a non-notified new substance. Well, let's start with the case number one. I failed the TCC for the second time. What are the consequences? <clears throat> there are two possible scenarios in here. Whether it's an initial submission or an update. If you have submitted a dossier in order to get a registration number to your substance, and this one fails the technical completeness check, you will receive a letter under your task in ReachIT requesting you to resubmit your dossier under a certain deadline. As mentioned by Tamash, this letter will present you the reasons of failing and explain how to address the failures. If your second submission is still considered incomplete by ECA, it will lead to a rejection of your submission. It means that ECA won't assign a registration number to your substance and the related fee won't be refunded. You will then need to proceed with a new initial submission. That's why we recommend you to read the TCC letter really carefully before submitting a date of your initial submission. Um, in this second scenario, your substance has been already registered earlier, but you have updated your dossier, either on your own initiative or following a regulatory decision. If your update fails the TCC, you are given a second chance to input your information. But in case your dossier is still considered incomplete at the second submission, your update will be rejected by ECA which means that the new information you were providing won't be taken into account by ECA. Please note that the rejection process might take some time and that a communication will be sent to your rich IT account when the rejection is finalized. You will need to wait uh, for the ECA decision before submitting a new update. Let's move to case number two. I failed the TCC and the TCC deadline is after another regulatory deadline. Which deadline do I need to follow? This happens when you have submitted an update of your dossier after the evaluation has requested you to provide new information under a certain deadline. But your resubmission failed to complete that check, so you receive a TCC letter requesting you to address some failures, and a new deadline is given. In this case, as explained uh, in the TCC letter, ECA won't continue with the evaluation process before you have submitted the TCC requested update or before the deadline given by the TCC. This means that the deadline given in the TCC letter is the one to follow. Case 
case number three. I have an ECA decision, but my study for this endpoint is still ongoing. How could I report this in my dossier? We actually get this question quite often. And <clears throat> this applies to the decisions from uh, compliance check, testing proposal evaluation, and substance evaluation. If you have to update your dossier, but one section cannot be yet complete, because uh, one study is still ongoing, we strongly recommend you to reflect this um, by using a data waiver and insert the standard phrase as uh, shown uh, in the current slide. Uh, ECA cannot accept any waiver such as ongoing study if the ECA decision number is not provided. And as soon as the study results are available, you can then remove this data waiver endpoint and replace it by the relevant study endpoint. Please don't forget to update as well other sections in Euclid um, that might have been impacted uh, as well, such as the CNL, PBT assessment, or the chemical safety. And fin finally, let's move to the case number four. Um, my previous uh, submission was a dossier for a uh, non-notified new substance um, with a uh, note management upgrade. Now I will become the lead of a joint submission uh, with the same tonnage band. Can I still rely on the non-derogation? A non-notified new substance uh, is a substance notified under the previous directive uh, in place before REACH. These substances are considered as registered uh, under REACH. Um, when a nonce registration is updated without any change to the information requirements, a limited completeness check is applied. However, when becoming a lead of a joint submission, your dossier becomes the reference point of the joint submission then the nonce derogation is no longer valid. A full completeness check will be performed, including manual checks. So you will need to update your information accordingly. Uh, the data migrated from all formats uh, can appear incomplete. So make sure that your uh, update covers all the required fields. And the same applies also to the cases uh, where ECA has given a permission to refer to study information older than 12 years, uh, failures identified by the validation assistance uh, have to be fixed. For more information regarding the nonce, uh, you can uh, have a look to the Annex 4 of the registration manual. Now let's have an overview of the support material offered by ECA to help you preparing your dossiers. You will find the registration manual on the ECA website in the section support. The manual is in English, but other languages are also available. On the same page, the same web, web page, you can find uh, additional information on manual, manual verification at completeness. Uh, we strongly recommend you to have a look into it. The registration manual is also available under Euclid by pressing F1 or by the help button. Different languages are also available. Um, as mentioned by Tamash, the validation assistant has to be run before submitting your dossier in order to minimize the risk of failures and rejection. In case of failure, you will receive a TCC letter under Rich IT in your task. And I take the occasion to remind you that you can add or update uh, email addresses in Rich IT so that the, the email notifications can be sent to the right persons. This option can be found in the menu at the Manage Company section under the email notification system. You can contact us uh, using the contact form uh, available on ECA website. Our experts will reply to your queries uh, as soon as possible.
please assign a relevant contact person in Rich IT. Uh, the person has to be responsible of the submission, as we may need to contact this person via uh, call or email. <coughs> Indeed, uh, we can contact you regarding your submission to remind you that the deadline is approaching or to assist you with complex case. And the summary of the discussion over the phone is always uh, sent by email after the call. Remember, we are here to help you, so we might try to call you. Please pick up the phone. As you can see, ECA makes available general support material, such as manual and published information, and also the validation assistant plugin. And uh, uh, it gives you as well, as well specific assistance regarding your submissions, such as letters, calls, or emails. Our aim is to help you to prepare your dossier successfully from the initial submission, to the registration and update. Thank you for listening. Now I will hand over to you. Well, thank you, Stefan, Essie, and Thomas for your presentations. I will now conclude with um, some final remarks. And at the end of the webinar, we'll have a short Q&A session with today's presenters. Uh, once more, I, I want to point out that it's very important for you to use the validation system before you submit your dossier, and never submit a dossier when there are still failures the validation system. And this will minimize the risk of uh, failing TCC. Um, it's important to note that the validation system does not check for manual. When you want to read more about this manual verification, there is a document available on our website. And uh, this document gives some detailed information about manual verification performed by ECHA. Uh, as a third point, it's important for you to um, check your reach IT task and messengers on a regular basis. And if you need help, Jane also mentioned it. We are here to help, so feel free to contact. Well, uh, let's continue with the Q&A session. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, our panelists have been quite busy today. Um, the first question is regarding the manual verification. So this one is for you, uh, SC. Do manual checks apply both to lead and member dossier? Uh, thank you, Jost. So yes, the manual verification applies to all registration dossiers which are submitted to ECHA. Um, however, the extent of the verification, of course, depends on the content of the dossier. So for example, for joint submission member dossier, um, there is rarely any data or study data, and therefore the manual checks uh, are not relevant for that type of content for member dossiers. Um, however, substance identity is an area that is common for all registration dossiers and is therefore checked in, in all dossier types, whether it's a lead member or an individual submission. Okay, thank you, Essie. Uh, the second question is about the quality checks in the validation system. Uh, so this one is for you, Thomas. Um, you mentioned that the submission, uh, you mentioned the submission checks in the validation assistant. What about the quality checks? Do I have to pass all the quality checks of the validation assistant to submit my dossier? Thank you, Jost, and thank you for the question. Well, the quality rules warn you of common inconsistencies and uh, shortcomings in your data. Uh, these are quality warnings will not prevent you from successfully submitting your dossier to ECHA and obtaining a registration number. However, leaving quality warnings uncorrected may lead to later clarification requests by ECHA. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas. Um, we also have a question for Tiffan. Um, what if I submit my dossier just before the deadline and it fails the completeness check? Is for this reason my dossier not issued a registration number before the uh, end of May deadline in 2018. Thank you, yes, for the question. That's uh, if your dossier failed, the completeness check just before the registration deadline of the 31st of May 2018 will be given a deadline of four months to complete the missing information. During this time, your dossier will still be 
considered as submitted, and you will still be entitled uh, to manufacture or import the substance uh, in accordance with the phase-in scheme until ECATEX is given on the completion of your dossier. Uh, if you then submit uh, all the requested information data within the deadline, uh, your dossier will receive a registration number and the registration date will be the date of the first submission. Thank you, uh, Tefeng. Uh, this brings us to the end of the Q&A session. Uh, remember that you have till half past 12 to submit your question. Our panelists are here till 1 o'clock to answer you. Um, and if you did not receive an answer by then, please resubmit your question using the contact form. Uh, when you close this webinar uh, page, you will be redirected to a feedback uh, form. Uh, we ask you kindly to fill in leave your feedback there so we can improve our webinar soon. Well, uh, this brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you all for joining us.